Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm here in the Crows Museum, of course, with the Crows' greatest player. Arguably, some might say Mark Rusciuto, but for me, it's the bungee man. Rusciuto. Not on the head, mate. Rusciuto. 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 Any good? Nah, he goes all right. He goes all right? Yeah, he, he's all right. Yeah. He's all right. Mate, Although, so how uh, would he go on morning radio? Could you imagine him getting up early? No, I think he actually did. I heard he might have come in late in his first day, <laughs> which wouldn't surprise me. He's probably too busy counting his money. Would not surprise me. Mate, it's been a couple of big weeks for you. Let's talk about the Hall of Fame first. So, I mean, we talk about your records, but we haven't got that much film. So, where, where does it stand? Hall of Fame, inducted into the Hall of Fame. Where does it sit? Well, I did, um, when I received a phone call from you and you said, well, you only got three to go. So, <laughs> it's a fact, fame, though. It is one, a fact. One, one Hall one. of Fame is not good enough. <laughs> Um, no, nah, but as a player, I think it's right up there, you know, like to be recognised, um, uh, to be part of the Hall of Fame. And when you go in, it's, it's one of those things that you don't, um, you don't understand it until you actually get there and you see the people. In, yeah. Like when you at, at the night and you see some of the guys and they come up to you and congratulate you and say, oh, you don't, like Robbie Flower came up to me and said, you don't know who I am, but I'm like, yeah, yeah Robbie Flower. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know you are, but it's, it's such a great um, honour. And you know, I think as a player, it's probably the, you know, I think it's the, the tip of the iceberg. Mate, you're a pretty humble bloke, so when you walk into that room, you're already feel humble by getting the letter that you can't tell anyone about. So no. I imagine that's hard to keep that a secret <laughs> for a while that for anyway. six weeks, yeah. yeah. But then you walk into that room, and, and a lot of those people would have been players you admired. Yep. Was, was there one or two in there where you felt, I'd like to go and say good day to him, but I really can't because I'm not good enough. Um, oh, there's a lot of guys there. You, you know him, and the, the thing for me though was my son because he was like, he—I don't think he understood that I knew a lot of these guys. And then come up and like Dipper would come up and grab you and put his arm, <laughs> you know, rub, rub his moustache on you, and he'd go, "Hey, brother, welcome to the club." And oh, now he's a brother. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so <laughs> you get that. But um, and my young boys like. Dad, you, you know Dipper, or you know such and such, and like that was probably the, the the really cool thing for me to see how excited he was. But yeah, for me, um, you know, a lot of those guys I grew up like, you know, you see Kevin Sheedy there, and I always I was a Bomber supporter as a kid, so I love Kevin Sheedy. Um, Michael Long came, Michael Long was one of my idols, so Michael yep. Long comes up and he sort of looks at me, and goes, "Hey, hey," it was like, hey, "Congratulations!" <laughs> and so yeah, that for me that was like. That was probably one, some of the highlights for me is the, those guys and um, you know you see the legends like Bobby Skilton and, and the like walking around. It's just it's just such a great honour. Then you've got to get up and talk in front of all of them. You know, so you, you, can you compare the nerves before a grand final game and the nerves to get up and talk in front of a room of the greatest footballers of all time? Nah, I'd take, I'd take the grand final any day of the week. But more, uh, more nervous yeah. before a grand final or more nervous getting up nah, and do more that? nervous talking speak. in front of all those yep. people and it's a bit like yeah you don't want to stuff up but I think for me it was also the fact that I was like fifth or sixth in line so just the, sort of just kept building and building <laughs> and then I was and I could see because Cuda went first and Cuda was sitting next to me um, his table was was right next to ours and uh, you could see that and he was he got quite emotional when he spoke and uh so then I was like, oh man, you know, the pressure from that. But then as soon as he'd finished, like his table was celebrating and they were all like enjoying it and having a couple of quiet drinks. And here I was sitting on my, sipping on my the water. water. <laughs> and the more I sipped on water, the thirstier I got. So I was like, oh, just get it done, get it done. And, but um, yeah, I, I think that just adds to the, to the night uh, and is, is all part of it. But yeah, it was, um, yeah, I, I'd take, I'd play in the grand final every day of the week. Be easier. Yeah. All right, mate, when you talk about you're having a few waters, I'm assuming Dad's had a couple of beers just to, to tidy things up. We don't see who sits at your table. So who's at Andrew McLeod's table on a night like that? Oh, so for me, it's my um, my own family. So um, Rach and the, the two kids. And then um, I had my dad um, plus uh, four of my good mates. Um, four that of I, your good mates, so. <laughs> so, so oh, sorry, four, I would have oh, been five. You, you I? were, you were. I was in the you were, you were next. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But now I had to, other blokes. So four, the four of my my best mates that I've basically grown up with, and you know, been um, so from my Darwin days, we all went to school together. Um, and, and one of my mates who who I lived with uh, when I first came down here. So um, yeah, it was it was quite nice. Except my, I would I did want my brother there, but yep. my, I rang my brother and I told him about it, and told him you know, how special it is, and my brother's like, well, I thought you were in the Hall of Fame already, and at the end of the day, you're, you're still my brother, so he, but 
I think it's more the fact that he doesn't like those things, doesn't like getting dressed up, a bit like yourself, never wear a tie. Um, I don't know where you're going with And this, uh, never wear a jacket, so he's like, I just feel out of place there, oh, I'm not going to come. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't come. No. Now, mate, you opened the speech magnificently, talking about your wife, Rachel. Was there a bit of help from Rachel? Were you encouraged by her to mention her first, mate? Or were you in trouble at home? Or was, it, was he actually being honest and saying she has done a lot for me? Well, you know, they say about um, happy wife keeps keeps men out of strife, it's yep. a bit like that. So I was like, um, nah, it's just it's one of those things. And Rach had been there. Um, and instead of thanking, you always people always tend to thank their missus at the end. And I thought, yep, well, get on early. I'll get on the front foot. Has and, it done uh, you any good? Um, no, nah, I'm still, no. <laughs> still, still, still can't get out doing things. But um, no, just it was more the fact that, you know, Rach had been there a long time, part of that, as you know, and shared that whole journey. Um, so for me, it was more about the, the whole thing was as much as a celebration for her as it was just for yeah. myself and, you know, for a couple of kids that came out of school um, and then came down to the big smoke, you know, 20 odd years ago. It's, um, it was nice to be able to share that moment with her. Well, she's grabbed the headlines a few times over the years for her snappy outfits, <laughs> mate, at the Brownlows and, uh, you know, she's kind of even pushed you over into the shadows. Yeah, a bit. I always get um, yeah, pushed behind into the, uh, into the shadows. Well, that's fair that's enough. She's better looking than me, <laughs> so it makes more sense. Now, mate, this has been absolutely magnificent. The bungee designed footy jumper. Yep. Tell us a little bit about it. Um, well, obviously it's about um, celebrating Indigenous Round. So Indigenous Round is something that the club, um, you know, the AFL has, has um, been recognising for a long time now. First time the club's had it in nine years. Um, so it was an opportunity for us to be able to create so something and I thought a good opportunity for us to tell the story of the Adelaide Footy Club. So design the jumper around how I saw, how I see the Adelaide Football Club being involved in the, um, you know, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander culture and, um, and particularly around our programs and what we do. So I designed it around um, how football, how the Adelaide Football Club brings community together and also about celebrating, um, you know, the, the life of the Adelaide Football Club, 24 years, the players that have um, been part of the Adelaide Football Club, the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander players, there's been 19 in the 24 years. So each one of the footprint represents um, their oh, contribution. Right uh, but it also tells a story, not just about the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander players, it also tells a story about everyone involved in the club, so around you know, players, supporters, um, administrators, and how they've been a part of that journey over that, that period of time. I mean, how do you get a vision for that? You know, I mean, I'm the worst artist in the world. There's oh, a question some, mark some, on some your would say that you're a pretty good artist. There's a, there's a question mark on your stars, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. But there, how do you get a vision? Are you, are you lying in bed and it hits you or you start drawing or uh, where does it come from? Oh, I was just thinking and I'm pretty lucky. You were thinking? Got, oh, I've got, yeah, that's <laughs> one, 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 one I'm that. pretty lucky that I was thinking. <laughs> but uh, no, I've got, um, in my family, a lo lot of my family are quite creative and my brother, um, he, dip, da he dabbles in a bit of... Um, um, painting and um, carving and stuff so I was talking actually I'll probably say I was talking to him about it and sort of got the inspiration from him he was saying well why don't you tell your story how you see it um, through your eyes and I was like oh that's a good start yeah. so yeah. I just I just thought that'd be a great great way to be able to do it um, so I thought well how do I tell a story of, the, of a football club and one that's Pretty young in terms of you know you look at the it's AFL, early, isn't it? you got yeah. Melbourne 150 years and you know those great clubs and then you got Adelaide who's quite young still. So how do I tell a story? And you know I'm pretty happy with what come up with and oh, I think um, so are the supporters. They're, you know, they've been <coughs> they've sold really well and um, you know it's been really good. On that, do you think there'd be a time where they go? Let's not just have it for one round of the year. Could they have the Indigenous jumper? For the whole season, I mean, you have an away jumper, you have a home jumper. Is there anything that would stop it being the main jumper? I don't think so. Um, obviously, a lot of clubs like to um, stick with tradition, and uh, traditionally, like someone like a Collingwood or the Crows have never changed their home jumper. They changed their away jumper. First time the Crows have changed their their home jumper um, for that round. For that round, which is quite quite special. Could it be done as a, an away jumper? Yeah, but I think um, you're right though. Part of the history and the, of the game and its origins is about celebrating where it comes from. And uh, one of those names that we hear about is Mangrook, where it originated yep. from. So how can you, um, you know, I think the AFL are looking at something anyway where they can celebrate the origins of the game. Tom Wills saw the game, 
being played by Aboriginal um, people in, in Victoria and basically developed the, the game out of that. So I think they're, they're thinking about a bit like what they're going to do with women and I think it's an important part to celebrate women in our game because, you know, women make up, um, I think it's, a, it's around 50 or 60 percent of the supporter base. Yep. So it's, it, they're, they're an important part of it, just like the, the culture and where your game has come from. Mate, it's always a touchy subject, but racism, not just in footy, it's in all codes. Are the AFL, in, in your eyes, heading down the right path? Because, you know, sometimes, and yeah. I don't want to be controversial, but sometimes you say we're going to do that, so they have the Indigenous round and then, OK, we've covered off on that now, we don't need to... Yeah. Are they pursuing it the right way? Oh, I think they've been one of the um, leaders in terms of um, around the education process, educating players, edu educating people um, involved in footy clubs, but then it's how, does, how do you take that and, and then start to... Um, pass that on to your supporters and, and like, because we see that it, now in terms of um, racial vilification or any vilification on field is pretty much nil in, in AFL. Yeah. And, but it seems to be that it's still happening over the fence. Yes. So how do you then educate people, how do you educate supporters and, and get them engaged? And it's one of those things where, you know, you, you don't have to, Supporters don't have to do it. It's not part of their charter of being part of your footy club, but I think it should be. So when, cool. and I think a lot of the American um, um, clubs over there, some of the baseball teams and some of the gridiron teams have gone down that path where they've, you know, part of signing onto your club means that you've got to sign a code of conduct and be, to become a member. And yeah. I think that that would be fantastic if it was adopted by the AFL. Yeah, outside of that, my, my daughter's best friend's an Indigenous kid from Port Augusta and you and I are mates, so we're clear that there's no problem here. Well, I like Rachel better than you, but we don't want to go <laughs> on too far on camera with that. But should we do more in the schools? Because, I mean, there was a really good quote, I can't remember where it was, where it came from, but it was said, you're not born a racist. So someone has to educate you no, to be not. one. Is it the schools where they should do more? Oh, I'd, I think so. Um, for me, you know, I look at my, my own schooling growing up and you didn't, um, you know, I learned a lot about the like the history of Australia and most of that was, was um, you know, post um, 1788. Like when you went to school, it was all around, um, you know, the early settlers coming in and doing this and yada, yada, yada. And then I could tell you so much about the Bush Rangers. I could tell you about Ned Kelly, Ben Hall and the like and <laughs> yep. you know, the scallywags that they were. But I think it's important that they, we do, um, and part of that rec recognition and the recognised campaign the AFL has been um, a part of is that um, you know we should be able to celebrate all cultures and part of our history. And you know our our, our history started way before 1788, but we don't hear a lot about it. Um, can we do that in schools and help educate people? Because you're right, because um, no one's no one's born that way. Um, it's something that it's a habit that you learn. Um, so how do we how do we teach our kids better um, to be able to understand each other? Because look at our game now. Look at any sport these days, and you know the, it's such a multicultural society that we have, um, and it's important that we all we embrace it and um, you know we celebrate each other because. That's, that's the way forward for our country. Right, let's talk about footy, mate. You look yeah. like you'd still be playing, mate. So you yeah. headed up a couple of years ago. You are up in the Northern Territory having a bounce, mate. You're assistant coach out there at Norwood. Do you ever feel like you want to get in there and just have another couple of games, mate? Um, no. No? No. Had enough? I, I, did, I have. I'll, and because every night um, my knee wake, tends to wake me up at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and just remind me that... <laughs> You've, you've done enough. You've done so, enough. Um, no. I, still I, have trouble with it? Do you still have trouble with it now? Yeah, I have a little bit of trouble with it. So, but um, yeah, it's part of, I think, part of the, part of being a sportsman, isn't it? You that's just, you, you, you wake up and you're just yep. a bit of a reminder. And that, I think that's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, I don't, um, I don't miss the game. I, I, I really appreciate it of the opportunity that I had and what I did. Um, and, I, and, and I'm uh, probably now, I'm a better spectator. I appreciate the game. Was I didn't really watch the game a lot when I finished. Um, and now, you know, a few years out of it, I'm, I'm starting to really appreciate and, and come back and, and love the game again because um, I needed that time off. But yeah, in terms of playing, I don't I don't miss it. Um, but I like like being involved still at some capacity. Coaching, mate. Could you see yourself going further? Could you become an AFL coach? 
You've seen what happened to coaches. Yeah, you yeah, know. No, no I, I, just, I always learn from Malcolm Blight, never say never. So yep. it's something that I'm just dabbling in at the moment and I've just got my toe in the water enough to give me a bit of a taste. But um, I, I can't see myself as a, like an AFL coach. Um, one, I don't. The, the, I just don't have the time. <laughs> I don't have the time and probably the patience. But um, no, nah, it's. I really enjoy what I do, working with young kids and helping them. And it's something that um, I think I'll continue. I made a promise to myself to get my programs up and running to a certain level before I decide to do anything anything else. And um, so I'm going to stick to that and, and see it through. A little insight into your programs. What do you got going? Well, here at Adelaide Football Club. So um, basically, I've got uh, four programs going at the moment. And uh, to give you the short versions, one is called a, um, is a McLeod Challenge, which is for year eights and nines. And we use footy as a bit of a vehicle there to engage the kids, play nine-a-side footy. Couldn't, couldn't get a better name for it? Um, no, no, I just... just put I your name on thought, it? Well, yeah, just keep, program, keep, 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 us, okay. keep it simple. Yep. Um, our, we have a year 10 program, which is a um, leadership, youth leadership program. And uh, so that's the kids come in and they study a Cert two in business. And those units go towards their say. So they... Um, um, we do four camps a year for the kids in that. Now, the, currently, we've got about 26, um, 26 kids in the program and increasing that in a couple of weeks to about 30. Uh, I have a year 11 and 12 program called Future Leaders. And they, the kids come back in there and they do some, some more um, work towards a, the Cert 2 and the Cert 3 in business, which goes towards their SACE. But also, they become good mentors for the other kids okay. and help them um, on, their, on their journey coming through as year 10s. Um, and then we have a uh, we have a scholarship program as well. So some of our kids have come from remote areas in uh, scholarship programs at schools. Oh, you have got a busy time going on, haven't you, mate? Now just to go back, you talked about you've just put your toe in the water there about coaching. Yep. You'd know enough, mate, from barra fishing, but you don't want to put your toe in the water because those big crocs come and take a fair bit off. Yep. Yeah, that's what happens to head coaches, mate. So there's 50,000 plus coming at you. So well, why would you? I'd stay busy for a little um, bit longer, mate. Well, I used to enjoy watching you from afar. It'd just be nice seeing you on the sideline and like this. <laughs> I always used to wonder what was going through your head when you were coaching and um, just watching some. But then you had blokes like Brett Maher who... Um, but let's talk about him for a bit. <laughs> so, because we're going to interview him later today. Oh. Most people wouldn't know that Marzi brought you out the training and said you couldn't dunk it. Yeah. And so you dunked it on him. Well, has, he, has he let that go now? No, he hasn't. And he's tried to pass it on. And I've had opportunities to... Um, um, to show it again because some of his ex-teammates, uh, one in particular, Scott Ninnis, didn't believe me, um, won a bottle of red off Scott for uh, dunking. But, it's hard to um, believe looking at Scott now that he could ever dunk it. No, nah, I can't believe he can. <laughs> <laughs> gravity, That's a good shadow. Gravity certainly weighs him down today. But um, no, nah, look, yeah, yeah, Brett was one of those, one of those guys and I used to come out and watch and I'd say, any chance of dunking and even in the warm-up he'd try to dunk and... Uh, yeah, it was quite. It was quite funny, but um, you know, was, I couldn't believe that a bloke that had played for so long and he's such a great player. And you know, he always talks about, well, you know, he's he won was. more championships than me, and <laughs> he's done. You know, he's won more MVPs and everything else. But um, as known as a great basketball, he never dunked. And um, I was like, well, no, that's what you're supposed wow. to do as, as a basketballer. Well, I think it's only fair to say back that he wasn't very really good at that. Can't fish either. And I, about well, fishing. that that would be that. So he can't fish, he can't dunk, and he's not in any halls of fame. So really, he's not as good as he thinks he is. He's got a bit of work to do. Then. He's got a fair bit, hasn't he? Andrew McLeod, our special guest. <laughs>